So today we have a conversation with Annie Haslam, who I first heard when she recorded with Renaissance, the album Sherazade, which the song was absolutely riveting, brilliant. She has a voice that covers a five octave spectrum. I don't even know what that means, except it's extraordinary. <laughs> it's extraordinary. Extraordinary enough that it's the second entry on her Wikipedia page. <laughs> yes, yes. But she does have a beautiful soprano voice. And I first came across her in person when she recorded with Steve Howe. And I thought then, gosh, that voice would do wonders for yes. <laughs> Too political to go into that. Um, and then you and I both met her at Nearfest. Mm -hmm. And that was wonderful too. She had a stand opposite us with all her paintings. Can you remember that? Yes, very clearly. And one of the things I remember as well was it was, I just, I didn't just think they were beautiful. They were very nostalgic for me because they reminded me quite a lot of Rudolf Steiner sort of paintings. <laughs> Those sort of light feeling emanating shapes and yes. we're going to put some images in the show notes, I think. But yeah, I, beautiful, I remember. I, I love them. And I did think I mentioned in the talk that I had my eye on one called Blythe Spirit, but I was just too slow. <laughs> it got sold before I plucked up the nerve to wander over and ask after it. That's what commissions are for. <laughs> well, I do now have a few of her paintings and hopefully we'll have them up on the screen with the talk. Anyway, she was, I mean, the talk was amazing because I knew she was amazing singer, amazing musician, an amazing artist, but she is such a wonderful, warm and very funny person, isn't she? Yeah, I was saying in the first recording of when we tried to do this intro, um, <laughs> that, um, one of the things that I find amazing about her to listen to is she has all of these stories and you just sort of start thinking, they can't have all happened to one person. And it's the same with Rick when he talks. You just sort of think, why do these things keep happening to you? <laughs> and it sort of makes you just sort of feel like the universe keeps giving these people these experiences because there's no one who could put them into words better. <laughs> and even in this conversation, she actually has a, a talk about Rick and a story involving the two of them, which is fantastic as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes she's brilliant she's really brilliant yeah it was brilliant fun we must do that again I hope she will agree to do it again yeah I mean for me like I listen to a lot of podcasts and this was one of my favorite episodes it's just really so uplifting and hilarious <laughs> and I love as well how she sort of pre-apologizes for her stories, but then plow straight in. I think it's five minutes in that we hear some story about her getting some ceramic from a toilet stuck in her bum. <laughs> <laughs> There's something for everyone in this episode. <laughs> Art, music, the supernatural, lots of toilet stories. <laughs> Not from dad. But <laughs> well, yes, there was lots of, it was, yes, it was fantastic. So a lot of nodding along from dad, not able to contribute. <laughs> well, <laughs> but I really hope we get Annie again. I'd love, I could listen to her for hours. Yes, me too. Me too. So, Annie Haslam, astonishingly amazing singer with an angel's voice, brilliant artist, and fabulous raconteur. Brilliant. A brilliant, beautiful, funny, brave lady. Annie Haslam. And you stop there, Dad. 
Okay. We are recording. Well, hello, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> hello, Annie. Um, I was thinking, I, I'm, I can't work out the dates, but when we were in um, Nearfest. Yes. Were you living where you are now when you were in Nearfest? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think that was around... Hmm, 2006, eight, yeah. something like that. It was yeah. Ten, you've been there ten got, years then. Yeah, we hadn't got the band back together at that point, and and yeah, I, I I got there. Let's see, I saw you twice there, didn't I? The first time I was upstairs. That's right. Uh, that's right. That's the first time I met you because I met Freya at the same time. Right. How old was Freya then? Well, she that. Was there. Yeah. That would have been 20 years ago, nearly. Yeah, because she, she was 12. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, so, 12 or 13, I forget, but in there. Yeah, yeah I was 12 once. <laughs> when I lived in Bolton, not Lob. How did you manage that? I don't, I don't think I was. <laughs> How did I manage being 12? Uh... <laughs> I, I, I yeah. explained to Freya once that um, blokes freeze at 12. Whatever they're doing at 12, that's what they do forever. <laughs> well, you know what? My, my mum and dad, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, we lived, lived in Bolton, two up, two down outside toilet. I sat on, we had a potty, you know, Jerry, we called it in those days. And, um, under my mum and dad's bed because we had an outside toilet. So if I wanted to go to the toilet in the night, I'd have to creep into their bedroom and pull the jerry out and take it. <laughs> <laughs> should, I be, should I be telling you? Well, yeah, because it's important because it left a scar, the actual scar. What happened was I took it out onto the landing, sat on it and a piece of the porcelain went straight, just missed my spine, just missed the base of my spine. Oh, shit. Yeah, it was very painful. My my dad, to, uh, we had to, I remember, uh, did we get an ambulance or did we walk? I don't know. You know, it's so different back then. Um, yeah. But uh, we didn't have a telephone. No, so we, we, might have gone up, we might have gone on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. And it, I remember, you know, being in, uh, being in the theatre and my, uh, my father banging on the door, let me in, let me in, because they gave me a local anaesthetic. Well, local, you know, because they had to go in deep, really didn't do very much. So it, I was in agony, you know. But anyway, my mum and dad, yeah, were um, uh, talking about that age. I guess it was around that age, 11 or 12, uh, um, my mum and dad uh, sent me to elocution lessons. And um, I thought, why are they doing this to me, you know? And and because I, I, I was I, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I was eleven, um, but they must have known something was going to happen for me. I think that's why they were wonderful parents. You know, they they they, they encouraged my, my both my brother my brother Michael who ended up singing and being managed by Brian Epstein. You know, they bought him a guitar, they bought him a banjo first and a guitar, and then you know just and they, they really couldn't afford it. Sent me to elocution lessons. Because I talk like this, yeah, yeah, right. Come on, man, let's have you. That's how I used to speak, you know. Can I have a piece of cake? <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> but um, so, uh, yeah, and, and they, mu they must have known, really, I'm, I'm thinking, that um, they, they encouraged me. They let me go to a secondary art school in Bolton because I guess they knew that they must have seen me drawing or something. Right. And uh, so they knew that that was a part of it. Did you ever get anything like that with you? How did you start? Did you start when you were really young? Were you encouraged? Was it just, or was your parents, did they write or did they paint as well? Um, weirdly, my mum did. She went to the same art school as me. She did really? Fashion. Yeah, she did fashion or fashion drawing anyway. Right. And um, I was just getting a whole bunch of her drawings scanned this last couple of weeks and um my dad did watercolors but he was an engineer in the army 
So I was, when I was 12, I was in at St. George's School in Hong Kong, which was brilliant. I mean, it was such a fantastic place to be age 12. And yeah. Hong Kong was great for music because American Forces Radio had rock and roll nonstop. And that would have been 1956, seven or 1958. So it was, I, I loved it there. And my, I loved that I traveled with my parents all the time in the army. The schooling was rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can, I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't. We've never. I've never been to Hong Kong. Been to Japan and that. But so, so tell me when when you started painting. Then, I mean, naturally doing paintings. Do you know what I mean? Rather than the drawings and doodles and things like that, which is how I started. I think. Well, when I went to art school, I had two ambitions really: one to design the future, and one to draw natural history, animals insects, lizards, that kind of stuff. So being in Hong Kong was terrific for that. But when I went to art school, it, the, it was mostly industrial design. I, I had no inkling that I would end up painting. Hmm. I designed um, this upstairs seating for Ronnie Scott's jazz club. Had you ever played there? No, I think I, no, I, no, I went there once in the 60s, I think, but I don't remember who it was I went to see, but no, I, no, we never played there, no. Okay, well, I did the seating upstairs in 1968, so it was back then, and they were quite enthusiastic about what I designed, but I showed them my sketchbook about, to show them what I wanted to do if we had more than two weeks, because we had two weeks to design and build it. And um, they said, oh, can we use that as an album cover? So that's, that's, uh, that's that was the beginning. Yeah. Wow. I remember at, at Neafest sitting opposite where you had a stand and really, really liking your paintings. And I'd made up my mind I was going to go and buy one. I had my eye on it. And I don't know why I hesitated because when I went across, how far was it? 10 meters, 20 feet, whatever 15, it was. 15 feet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When I went across the buy it, it had gone. So I bought another one and I realized I probably bought the one I really should have bought in the first place. Although I was a bit annoyed that I was too slow off the mark. Yeah, Rob, uh, Rob bought it, didn't he? The, one of the um, Neafest promoters. You're right. Yes, God, I, yeah. I can see it right in front of me because it had that thing floating in the sky, didn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and it was amazing because I had not known what you could do with Golden Open, which is what you were using. Uh, not, I wasn't using it then. I don't, uh, was I? Let me think, because it's the way back, isn't it? Uh, I wasn't using it then, and I don't know how I got turned on to it. I think it was maybe somebody, um, let me think about this. If somebody I knew. Look. I think I was talking, yeah, I was talking to somebody. Oh, yeah, look at that. There you go. I think, isn't that called Where's Roger or something? <laughs> It is. Is it? <laughs> but these, you can only get those effects with open. It must have been with open. No, it wasn't. <laughs> oh, well, you would know. No, no, it wasn't. I, 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 the reason I got open, I was talking to somebody and uh, 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 I, I, God, my memory so, I think it's just uh, so much stuff in my head. It's crazy. Um, but I was saying, you know, um, um, because what happened was I started off when the voice in my head in my den said, it's time to start oil painting now. When I was winding up, I was winding up my solo singing career because I was just so fed up with the struggle. 
and somebody else had kind of messed, messed some business up for me and it, it killed me. I, I just thought, I've got to do something else. So I thought, well, you know, what am I going to do? And I thought, well, I like photography. And people said, why don't you teach music? Well, I don't read music. I don't write music. Um, I'm deaf in one ear. You know? <laughs> I mean, that's not really... You know? Perfect. What was that? What Perfect. was that? Yeah. <laughs> and, well. uh, and so... Um, yeah, a voice in my head said, it's time to start oil painting now. And I, I went and I thought, it's clear as day. I've had that happen three times in my life now. And I thought, right, I'm going to act on that. And I did. And I, I changed my sunroom into a studio. And I, I bought, I went and bought lots of paint, oil paints. Um, I bought a book on oil painting, but I'm not a reader. I feel so bad when I say that, I'm so ignorant. But I've never been a reader, even when I was a child. I mean, I'd read what I had to read, but for some reason, I don't think I can remember. It doesn't stay there if I read something. But anyway, so I bought, but I bought a book. I thought, I've really got to read this. <laughs> I read one page and I got bored. And I thought, oh, I can't be bothered with this anyway. So two months went by and I, I was waiting. I bought, I bought everything. And I, and I just one day woke up and I thought, today's the day. And so I went out into my garden, I picked a big tiger lily. And um, it, it, I thought, where do I start? Because I didn't read the book, you know. <laughs> so I sat there and I just, I thought, well, you know, I'll do the sky first and I'll do blah, blah, blah. And, and I did this and, and I did this flower and I thought, I'm not meant to do flowers. I'm not a flower, I, I, you know, I'm not a flower girl. I, I've never been, you know, in the seventies when, when everybody was wearing all these really, you know, high heels and, and flowery dresses, that really wasn't me. You know, I don't know what, I'm not a man, you know, I don't want to be a man. I'm not gay for anybody out there. I'm not, <laughs> um, <laughs> unless the money's right. <laughs> until this virus, you know, kills me, whatever, anyway. And so I, um, I did this flower and I was so disappointed and I, I thought, okay, now, I, but when I did that, I felt like I, um, when I was doing the grass at the bottom, the green, I felt like somebody was holding my hand. And that, so that was really special. So I thought, well, this isn't right, don't get upset. I think I did five paintings that day five or six, I couldn't stop, like the floodgates opened. So I thought, I'm gonna do the grass. So I did the grass and again, I felt this hand holding my hand and, and, and this flow was coming out and I was like, whoa. And it was all green, it's all green this picture, but it's all got the depth in, you know, a little bit of the depth that my paintings, you know, became later on. And, uh, and then the third one um, was, uh, <coughs> I just got some red and some blue and I didn't, I had no idea what was coming. Like it's usually the same with me. And I think with you, sometimes you, you slap, you plug into something and it all comes in from somewhere. It's amazing what a gift that is, you know? And so I, uh, I was, I did this painting and it was all red and it looked like a big sun. And then the sky had this blue, 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 pale blue and red swirls in it. And, and I thought, whoa, what, what's this? And then all of a sudden in front of me, in my studio, right about six inches away from me, a little red spider appeared on a piece of silk. And it's right in front of me. It's like a dark red, bright, dark red, small. I saw it and whoa, and, and I went like that and it was gone. And when it was gone, my whole studio filled up with the smell of um, pipe tobacco. And, and it was Vincent van Gogh. And that painting looks like Vincent van Gogh. Right. I can show it to you if you like. And why not? I'll get it. Hang on a minute.
So this one was the first one. Okay. You know, with the, the, the grass there. Yep. And yep. the tiger lily. Love that one. Yeah, that's the one with the blue. This, yeah, looking at the, yeah, this is the way up. So that's the sun and that's the sky with all the blue and the red swirls in it. And that's when that, that and it's that smell stayed in my studio for months, months and months. And uh, I got that, I get that. Also with Leonardo da Vinci, if I do something, because I love him, he's my favorite. A apart from you, I like your work as well. <laughs> There's a relief. He's the first, you're the second. Uh, <laughs> I remember oh, uh, this. Not bad being second to him. I, um, I, I, sometimes I would do a painting and um, it, I, 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 I just, it just use brushes because people said, do you use your fingers? I said, no, don't use my fingers. Um, uh, uh, but, you know, just because of some of the effects and I did, I was doing this, something with the brush and it looked like a piece of velvet. Mm. And I thought, wow, my God, or it looked like a piece of silk. And I didn't do it thinking, oh, I've got to pay. You know, if there's any restrictions on anything, I can't do it. You know, if it just let, just let everything go and not even think about it, it just pours in and then it's like, you know. Um, so uh, I've lost my train of thought now, what we were talking about something else. <laughs> but anyway, I know that you, you have, have said that, that you, you more or less have a similar kind of thing to me, don't you? Where, um, and it has a word. Um, oh, what is it? Oh, I'm, hopefully I'll remember it. Somebody wrote to me and, and said that you have this, um, <clears throat> where, you know, you get these people that can uh, smell color. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, yeah, it's got a synesthesia. Well, that's it. That's what this guy said. He said, That's what you've got. And then I thought, You're right, because I've, I've started painting songs. I can paint one, any song you want, I can paint it. I just, and, and, and what I do is, it's funny, I've done maybe three or four Northern Lights, and it's they're not never the same because what I do is I get the person to send me, um, um, a photograph of themselves so that I can tune into them and it's of course it's their interpretation through me of what Northern Lights is to them does that make sense but um so yeah painting songs um I love doing pet portraits I mean it takes me five minutes to do the background for a pet portrait you know what there's one here actually All oh, right. Oh, amazing. Is that yours? Yeah. That's bugle. So every every pet's different. Um, obviously, they're all different, aren't they? Um, yeah. So I, I, that's something that I've been doing for a while. I absolutely love it because I kind of it's it, it takes longer to do the faces and everything. Um, I usually. Uh, print out a photograph and trace it just so for the eyes it saves me time just to know where everything is you know I did the first one and, and a, a cat and it wasn't too bad actually but and then I just kind of something happens I just tune into that pet I one, love of, it. one of the things I was going to do because um, what got me off on doing these talks was conversations I'd had in the past about where do ideas come from yeah and this, this sounds to me like this is exactly what you're talking about right now, yeah. where ideas come from. You know, somebody says to me once, uh, in fact, um, my friend, um, uh, Laura Gardner, she, we do the artwork together. She's, she, she's the graphic um, side of things. I'm not very good at, you know, putting an album. I can paint and, but putting it all together in a package is very difficult, to, you know, that side, that side of it. So she does that, but I spent a lot of time with her over the years. And when I, the kids were younger, um, they were about, I don't know, five or six or something like that. And they, they said, can you teach us how to paint? So it, I've done this also with Michael Dunford's um, 
two songs as well. We did that in England. And I said, look, you've, we, it, you, what you need to do is you can't think about what you're doing at all. You need to, you really need to just sit and just, it's, that's right. Not everybody can do. I can't meditate. So I think I meditate when I paint. Hmm. You know, I can't sit down. Uh, I just can't do it. It's just not because there's so much in my mind. But if I'm if I know that I'm doing a painting, um, it's a whole different thing when I'm creating that kind of thing. I know I, I never knew this was coming. I went to art school, funnily enough, to be a dress designer. And you know, so your mother, your mother was went for fashion design, didn't she? She did fashion drawing. Fashion drawing, fashion yeah, design. yeah, I, I, yeah, the similar kind of thing. I've got a funny shadow on my face. Looks like I've got a black beard now. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I'm changing faces, of Annie Aslan. Bloody hell! <laughs> oh, there you go. That's a nice beard. That's a nice look. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, oh, what, yeah. what is the shadow? Is the shadow your computer? Is the computer casting a shadow? That's better, isn't it? Yeah, that's better. We start again then. <laughs> we can do it again for sure. But let's do it again additionally rather than instead of. Right, yeah. No, um, yeah, so uh, where are we now? See, that's where my brain goes. Oh, yeah, so what I did is I sat down and I said, said, this is what I did with both boys, actually. They both got boys. They're grown up now. And I said, you just need to sit down and relax and just don't think about anything. Don't think, don't think you're going to copy me. You just got to, you just got to feel the flow, you know, just think about a f something flowing, not like you've got to do a straight line or anything like that. And that, and all of them came up with really, really fabulous things because they managed I, to do it. I find, I, I listen to books on tape because yeah. I find that, the perfect way of totally distracting me. It just takes my thinking mind out of the equation. It ah. switches it off. And, and so when I'm focusing on that, I can get on with the work. So you listen to books, that, yeah, and what I do is, oh, what's that? Who's that? Somebody scratching, it's one of my pets here. Oh well. Um, I like to have in the background uh, an old movie and I've seen and, and even though uh, I don't look at it very much it's uh, I like British movies I'm gonna try and get rid of this how is that oh. who's scratching stop it can you hear that yeah <laughs> Angel I don't know where she is Anyway, uh, I like Rebecca, the movie. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And um, I've, God knows how many times I've had that on, but I just, it's just, the whole feel of that is it's such an incredible movie. I love it. And, um, you know, Daphne du Maurier lived down the road from me in Cornwall. Yeah. And I got to meet her years later. I got to meet, I, had, I got to meet her. It was, what a thrill. You did? Yeah, hang on a second. Hang on a sec. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Who is this scratching? Angel? It's my little dog Angel. She found her way into my office. <laughs> you scratched it. <laughs> there she is. Ah. <laughs> she was a puppy mill dog. Hello. Uh, she lived in a in a in a rabbit cage for three years. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So she came to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so I guess probably because I met her, but I love her work anyway, Daphne de Maurier. Yeah. Because uh, I lived in Foy, we moved down to Cornwall for my mother's health. 
um, when I was 13. Um, and she she lived close by in the house called Menabili, which that was the house on the uh, it overlooked the ocean and everything the sea, and that's the one that they based Rebecca on, you know. Um, mm. And then years later, I was visiting Cornwall, and she'd moved to another house called Kilmarth, and that was another one that was like not far from the other one that she was in. And I just went just to walk around, just to reminisce. Really, I didn't know anybody else that lived there. And uh, there she she was, a place was there, you could see in the distance, and there was a big, gigantic field. And I was with a friend of mine, and I w walked up to the gate, and then she comes walking towards us across the field. <laughs> and she, no, she just came up and said hello, it was like amazing. <laughs> so that's, you know, I love listening, uh, watching, uh, not, not really watching them, but having that kind of thing in the background, and it's, oh, it's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, and sometimes music, but I think, Something about, you know, old movies and, you know, I used to go out with Norman Wisdom's son. So every now and again, every now and again I'll put a Norman Wisdom movie on. <laughs> I met him, you know, once. I he opened the door, went to his house. He opened the door and I burst out laughing. And I said, I'm so sorry. <laughs> because my mum and everybody loved Norman Wisdom, you know. Yeah. Mr. Grimsdale! <laughs> I met him once too. It was... He was um, one of the guests on Rick Waitman's This Is Your Life. And I was invited along to that too. They lived in the Isle of Man, didn't they? Yes. That's why. I guess we got, that's how they became close friends, I would say. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And, and so Rick Waitman, yeah. Now he's, he's a funny man, isn't he? He is. I like him. I like Rick. He came he, he, when he came to Philadelphia once. He was playing with his son Adam, and yeah. I was with my ex-husband Mark and Ed Sharkey, who's a very famous um, DJ in the Philadelphia area, who uh, was responsible for us. You know, he played us all the time in the seventies, and that's he helped. You know, turn everybody yeah, on. I mean, they they uh, honor him as launching Yes in America. That's right. Yeah. He, yeah. Yes, as well. And, um, uh, all right, I've lost my train of thought. Where was I? <laughs> you were talking about being, seeing Rick Wakeman there. Oh, that's right. So we went to see, uh, we, we, we met him, met him for a curry. Like, <laughs> okay. Like it's we very, all do. Very like famous a, curries. <laughs> you cut up a curry. Oh God. Uh, yeah, we had a curry with my ex-husband, Mark me uh ed rick and adam and we went for a curry before before the show i think it was after the surgery before the show i'm glad i wasn't on that stage um and um rick is notorious for having curries delivered during the show I've, that's a good idea i've never seen it but it's the rumor oh god oh god I've got a very rude story to say about that one. I don't know whether to tell you or not. I can't going to tell you because it's very funny. Uh, it, it was extremely embarrassing. But um, anyway, let me tell you about this first. Uh, yeah, so we had, we, we had this dinner and, he, and Rick was so filthy in what he was saying about everything. I mean, I love that. I, it's, it's just dirt box humor, isn't it? That's what he called it, litter box humor. <laughs> we couldn't stop laughing and Ed as well, but my ex-husband really was like, it was a bit too much for him. <laughs> but we, um, yeah, I remember, do you want me to tell you this story? It's a bit rude. Well, you're going to have it's to tell really, me. It's not really rude. You can always cut it out if you don't want it. What's that shadow there? <laughs> Uh, so, um, we were playing at the Capitol per se, uh, which was uh, the John Sher, um venue um, in New Jersey, and he was our manager at the time, and um, on the day off, and, uh, we never, never did this again after that, sorry, what, what's that light there? Oh. Well, that's good. Keeps coming, there you go, that's a bit there better. You go. Yeah. So anyway, um, We'd had a curry on the day off. That's not good. <laughs> oh. And I, I, I was a bit concerned in the morning. I, I went to the bathroom and I thought, well, I'm okay. <laughs> no. 
so but during the day we got to the venue and it, the stage was ginormous huge stage very very deep and at the back of the stage was like this area where they put the, the uh, flight cases you roll them in there you know and uh, I, I was on stage and everybody was setting up the stuff and they really weren't quite ready for me so I thought okay so I just went and I thought oh, oh god oh god oh no oh no oh no and I I, I there's nowhere I could go um, because I, m my body was just, <laughs> you know. Um, so I, I went to the very, very back of, of the, st of the uh, stage. I'm showing you my house, aren't I? <laughs> Here we go. I know it's a fireplace. That's a fireplace I don't use. Okay. <laughs> Because there's a painting in front of it. Um, so uh, I go to the very back and I thought, I, 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 I couldn't, you know, I had wind. As my dad used to say, have you just done a pardon me, Aram? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was dying and I thought, oh, and I, I you know, just, I, I, so I stayed there. I'm hiding. <laughs> Because I thought, I can't move yet, you know. <laughs> oh, my God. And then John Bora, bless his heart. He was our tour manager and he was my guardian angel. He used to look, really watch over me. He went, Annie, Annie, where are you? We need you on the microphone. Sound check, sound check, you know. And I, oh, and I, and I didn't feel safe. I didn't feel that the air around me was safe. <laughs> So I kind of sidled over as slowly as I could, hoping that there was nothing following me. And I was in front of the microphone and John looked to me and said, and the microphone was on, Annie, have you just farted? <laughs> it went everybody, you know, all the PA and everything. <laughs> but no audience, hopefully. <laughs> so that's a pardon me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what another name for a, a, a fart is in Lancashire? A trump. I see. Yes, I heard. Yeah, have you, that's another one my dad used to say. Have you trumped our own? Not that <laughs> I'm not saying to everybody that I do it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> certainly, it wasn't, certainly it wasn't eating curries when I was a little girl, you know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we haven't so got you you like, did, you know, you, 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 you treated us, me, who else was it at Nearfest that time? Who was with me? Anyway, whoever I was with that was helping me, you, Krista, remember my friend Krista? Yeah. Told, well, think Krista was there helping me and you took us out for a meal because I remember you shuffling us around saying, well, we don't want to, you don't want to sit there because you don't want you back to the door. And it can't sit over there because this, that, and the other. So <laughs> half an hour later, when we found the table, um, was that an Indian restaurant? You know what? Finding somewhere to eat there was was a nightmare, wasn't it? it was Bethlehem was uh, yeah, Bethlehem. It was Bethlehem, but you know what? Later yeah. we discovered up on the hill opposite there were some great restaurants. It's just they weren't near the university where we were. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got to be in the right spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I like Bethlehem, actually. It's lovely, isn't it? It's, it's beautiful at Christmas time because um, there's this, because it's on a hill as well. They, they, they put a star up at Christmas, you know. Yeah. It, might, it might be there all the time. I'm not sure. <clears throat> but... <laughs> What we haven't talked about is UFOs, music, um, in fact, music. pretty much anything, really. <laughs> uh, I know there's a lot of stuff, you know, people say, why don't you write a book? I could never write a book because I don't want, I don't want to go into my past. I don't mind talking about it in an interview or whatever, but uh, I would have to put everything in there because that's who I am. And it would upset a lot of people. <laughs> I'm not I'm not into that why, why would you want to do that just to make money or you can make some money at it I'd rather not have any money I don't I wouldn't be able to live like that you know 
And that, not that way. That's why I'm broke. <laughs> But it's okay. No, the, the, you know, I'm not. I'm not like that. I'm not like a money grabbing person or blah 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 blah. I, I don't but, think you should write a book to make money. I think you should write a book because it would be fascinating. I know. Well, it, yeah. But I'm, as I'm, uh, the most important thing is I would have to tell. I mean, this. The, you know, there's a lot of things that would shock a lot of people, and I wouldn't want to do it. Then don't. I tell I tell close friends though sometimes. Okay. So uh, yeah. I can see that. Oh no, we started quarter of an hour late. I thought we'd running an hour. We haven't. But we this time or next time are you going to tell me about what you hinted at in your letter? Oh yeah. Well, <clears throat> it started off. Uh, um, yeah, I I was. Um, I was working in a flour mill, <laughs> uh, but I was a receptionist. I wasn't actually in the mill with the flour, <laughs> but in here in bags, you know. No. Um, and uh, I used to live in, where was I living then? Um, Chingford, North Chingford. And I used to have to get a bus to the flour mill that was down in Enfield Way, that around that area. Uh, Ponder's End, I think it was called, and it was yeah. a family business, and I was just, I hadn't started singing then, but I, I, it was close, it was coming close, but I had no idea what I was going to be doing, really, so I had to work to keep going, so I get this job, and I was at the bus stop, and uh, it was, I guess it must have been, would that be winter time? it was dark at seven o'clock, uh, Anyway, it was it was kind of getting light, but anyway, we were about ten people at the bus stop, and somebody said, "What's that up there?" And it looked like this silver cigar floating across the sky, and um, I never forgot that. I mean, we we all saw it, and then the next time anything happened was the morning of my father's funeral in Cornwall, and um, I went out to pick up uh, the rest of the band that were coming down their their. Um, Stay, the, the train was coming in around 6.30 into St. Hostel, I think it was. And uh, so I, I drove I drove down there to pick them up. This was about six in the morning. Again, funnily enough, it was kind of darkish, you know. Um, and I was with my brother, Michael. And he's the kind of person, that he, he, you know, he, he wouldn't believe in anything like that. Uh, or it, it's got to be like black and white, uh, you know what I mean? That kind of thing. And... But on the, we got to the station and the train was delayed for an hour. So we thought, oh, we might as well go home. So we came back home. As we were coming back uh, to my mum's house, and it was just outside Foy and not far from Daphne, Mar Daphne de Moria country. It's all around that area. So there were like really tall uh, hedges, you know, narrow, narrow roads. Um, and I, I had a Range Rover at the time and um, second hand, I'll, I'll add. Um, and um, got there, it, it had a very big, you know, the, the earlier ones had got even bigger windscreens. Do you know what I mean? The yeah. first Range Rovers. Yeah. And so it was like a, a giant picture window, and all and we're driving along there. All of a sudden, in this picture window, was we could see, and I said, I've got to pull over. Do you see that? And he said, Yeah. And it was three, three lights in the sky. Um, <clears throat> very bright uh, and uh, I don't have no idea how far it was away but we both saw it and it, it came closer like that and it's still not right on top of us and and then it it just stayed there and then it it was gone now I think only because of my other experiences and the anagram of my name would you like to know the anagram of my name Alien like, yeah. Shaman. What? Alien Alien Shaman. <laughs> Not good. Anyway, uh, yeah. so I've had all kinds of things going on in my life um, since then. Um, but I think that nothing happened because we were we were in mourning. Yes. So that's what I think. And then, uh, you know, over the years, I've, I've, I've seen things. I saw, I was with my ex-husband in Puerto Vallarta. His company had a, every year they used to um, take their employees on a trip. And it was wonderful. They were really a fantastic company. To, they did it. And 
really, really good people. And we were in Puerto Vallarta, but I, I didn't like the fact that we're in a hotel and on the other side of the wall where the private beach was, it was just terrible poverty with, with uh, donkeys and everything in the water. And it was, uh, I didn't like it at all. It, it, I would never do that again. I just, anyway, but about three o'clock in the morning, I think it was, I was just, I got out of bed and went to the window. And I saw in the distance, but it was it definitely, it was three, three, three rows of colored lights. So red, red, green and yellow or red, blue and yellow, whatever it was spinning around. So I, I woke up, Mark, I said, Mark, you've got to come and look at this. And he, he came to, he said, what are you doing, man? I don't really, a load of rubbish. No, no, come, come, please come and have a look. I said, look, there it is, it's right there in front of you. He said, I can't see anything, go back to bed. So, um, but then, uh, when was it, 19, oh, when did I go to Brazil for the first time? 19, um, I went with Michael Dunford in 1979 to promote the album As You Adore and uh, just do interviews and everything. And then um, went back again, uh, two amazing guys in Brazil who were fans contacted me and said, why don't you come down to Brazil? I said, well, you can get me some shows, I'll come down. So I did, but I only went with one other guy, David Biglin. And we, we did a show, he took some tapes, I don't know if he did it, it's amazing. A, a, a clairvoyant told me, you're going to go to, you're going to go overseas a long way and you're going to only go with one musician. I said, no way, that's not going to happen. How can I sing a Renaissance song with one person, you know? Uh, then and that happened. So we were, we, we had shows in Sao Paulo, Rio, and a place called Petropolis, which is outside of Rio, about two or three hours up in the mountains. This place is gorgeous and it had a cathedral and uh, all, nearly all the trees had orchids growing on them. You know, it's just this. Uh, have you been to Brazil? No. You have been? No. Wow. Um, it, it's just uh, the, what, the most wonderful thing about it, though, are the people. I love the people. And, you know, we've been there several times now. But we, we were playing in Petropolis. And I was outside of my dressing room on this little hill and David Biglin was out there, my friend Carlos and somebody else who worked and the place was packed. It was called the Acoustic Shell and it was, the, it looked a little bit like the egg in Albany, but, but smaller and it was all, um, all made of wood. It, it, we didn't know what it was going to sound like, to be honest, but it, it, it came out great. So just before that, I did my exercises. I was standing uh, doing my breathing exercises and uh, my friend Carlos was there. And I went, whoa, look at that up there. And I said, this is a UFO. David Bigley said, no, it's not, but that is. And we saw this, <laughs> I know, it was crazy. Uh, it was close to the cathedral. It was a, like, a, a, it had a spire on it, that kind. And, um, we were looking at it, I've got to go and get my camera, I nearly broke my neck, I got running to get my, I had a high eight, Canon high eight, brought it back, said, Carlos, come here, I want, I've got to hold this on your shoulder, and he was shaking, he said, I don't want, I don't want, I to stop shaking, I, I've got to, I've got to film this, um, I, I, but I, I zoomed in on it, and I got it on, on film, and so when I got back from Brazil, um, I contacted my friend at Inside Edition, and um, I, I, he, um, he's, he's one of the producers there. And I said, Chris, I, I've, got, uh, I've got this video of the UFO. Um, and we, we, the album that we, we recorded, uh, the three shows, and the album was going to be called Under Brazilian Skies. And he, he said, well, this would be amazing for you your release and everything is in a UFO, you know. And they, I'd already done a thing for Inside Edition when I put on that concert at, called Lilies in the Field and brought in Justin Hayward and all that lot, you know. That's another time. There's too much to tell you, really. But anyway, so he said, well, come up and let's let's have a look at it. So I went up and um, he took me into the editing suite. Just before then, he introduced me to this guy who was um, the, the foremost um, expert on UFOs at that time. And so he, he was there with us. So that was me, the engineer, um, and this guy, Chris. And so he, he put the, and I, I, of course the camera was shaking, so it was moving all over, but he, he, he did manage to stop it where it was sharp. 
and he got a, he got a shot of it, the, the guy, the editor, and he didn't believe in UFOs at all, you know. And, but the weirdest thing is, and like, it was, I can remember it now because I thought my heart was going to stop. When he, he stopped it, it was a face in the sky. And it was like, um, you know, the Mayan, uh, you know, the, the Mayan um, carvings are all kind of rigid, aren't they, square yeah. and yeah. things. Um, and it, it, but it looked like Jesus. It looked like, it looked like it could be Jesus. And we all, we all, we, we all swore. <laughs> <laughs> it's a face, you know, it's a face. And it, it was like, we couldn't stop saying it's a, it's a face, it's a face, it's a face. It's a face. And, uh, and he, anyway, he turned the knob one more time and there it was, a UFO. And the top of it was pale pink and the bottom of it was dark pink. And the guy said, um, he said that that type of UFO is very, very common in Brazil. So... Uh, <laughs> But anyway, uh, because I, I, I lost my point of interest, focus, you know, and I focused in on the on the cathedral, it didn't. I, it, I lost the point of um, what do you call it? A point of interest? I, uh, no, what do you call it? <laughs> ah, uh, anyway, because I zoomed in and you couldn't see the cathedral, yeah. right? Because I'd, I'd lost it because I, you know, zoomed in. So yeah. that was that, and so. Um, you still I've have got, no, no, I've got, oh, and when I started painting though, th 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 Roger, the, the, the weirdest thing was, so the first painting was a flower and, you know, I knew, I knew straight away that I got upset, as I said, because I thought, why am I painting a flower? And it's awful. It's not very good. You know, I thought, no, this is not what it's about. And then I did the grass and then I did the, you know, the Vincent painting without knowing what was coming. And then the next one after that was a UFO over the ocean. And, and without any thought, no, no thought whatsoever. So my guest room is full of all these different paintings of different planets and, and landing strips and all kinds of stuff. Amazing. And do you, oh. still have, <laughs> you still have the recording you made of it. Uh, I do, yeah. That's good. So, have you ever seen any anything like that at all? Any experiences? I saw something so tiny, it could have been anything. Um, this would have been 1957-ish in Hong Kong. And I saw a little speck, which I just assumed was an aeroplane but it moved too fast. Cause you see an airplane when it's a little speck, you know, it just moves across, right? you know, really slowly. But this went like that across. It could have been, but I was very curious about it. Well, it wouldn't have been a satellite, would it? Well, in those days, it could have been Sputnik. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Yes. Sputnik. There was a band called the Sputniks, wasn't there? There was, but there was also <laughs> a satellite called Sputnik. Yeah, yeah I bet the you saw something. One. <laughs> yeah, I bet you saw something there. I don't know. It certainly was an option. Right. I, I, I yeah. I mean, I, I'm open to, I'm open to everything really. I, I, I just. Um, because I've had so many different experiences, you know. Oh, I'll tell you one. Um, when we played in Korea, uh, it was, uh, when was it, 2011 in Seoul yeah. with Renaissance. And um, we only went out for two shows. It was crazy. Um, and it was when Mr. Kim, do you remember the dad? Mr. Kim was uh, handing over... Um, everything to his son, the leadership and everything to his, his son. Um, and they, in, in, uh, in North Korea, they were having this giant parade. The second, it was the second day that we were performing because it was two days in the same place, the mapping center, I think it was. 
it was really did very well. I think it was sold out both nights. The audience were amazed because Renaissance in any form had never been there. So it was really wonderful. So the second night um, I was uh, on stage and we'd, um, our, we had a different light, uh, a different uh, sound engineer for this one, Chris, who, who we hadn't used before. And um, he, 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 was, he talked to the lighting people about the lights and had already got uh, the lighting plot um, to give him. Um, so we, we don't use, you know, my advice is never use dry ice unless you've got people that are experts on how to use it, you know. And so wherever we, and also sometimes they, uh, they use it, um, it's got oil in it. Uh, and that's really bad for singers. <clears throat> but anyway, so that wasn't an issue. I didn't even think of it because it was in the rider and it, and it wasn't used anyway. But what happened was in, in a song called Midas Man in the second verse, for a split second while I was singing, Mr. Kim, his face came, it was right there in front of me, right there, a split second. And I said, I'm sending love to you, Mr. Kim. I'm sending love to you, Mr. Kim, in my mind. And then in a, in a second, he was gone. So I clipped a word. I clipped a word in that, it was happened that fast. It was only his face right there, right there. So anyway, I, I thought, well, I've got to put myself together here. So I'd forgotten about it because I had to do, you know, the rest of the show. So when I came off stage, Chris came up to me, he said, Annie, he said, the weirdest thing happened when you were on stage. He said, um, in Midas Man, in the second verse, in the second line, there was a white mist around you. A white mist appeared around you. And he said, I went to the, to the girl who was there doing the, you know, because you usually have the lights and the sound close to each other. And he was shouting, I told you no dry eyes. She said, I'm not touching anything. That is weird. Isn't that the weirdest thing? And I went to Japan when they had the tsunami. I went there um, and um, I took one of my painted guitars as, uh, for an auction. Um, and um, a friend of mine uh, donated his ticket so I could go club class. And um, it was it was incredible. I was there, but I was there too long. It was it was it, it was upsetting to fly in and see all uh, the debris in, in the water and walk through the streets. Um, you know, where the, there was wires everywhere, you know, because a lot of the electricity was still cut off. Um, and so th this, a similar thing happened when I went on stage and I went on stage about one o'clock in the morning and I got jet lag and, you know, God, well, you've been to Japan, haven't you? Yeah. Freya yeah. lives there. And, uh, giving uh, yeah, Freya years. lives there, doesn't she? Yeah. That jet lag has got to be the worst. Well, that in Australia, I guess. But yeah. And uh, so I was... It, I, I haven't got rid of my jet lag until I get home, do you know what I mean? But I, I was singing at 1.30 in the morning and I had these young Japanese musicians who played back me up, they were fabulous. And I was so tired, but a similar thing happened there as well. But I don't know what it was or who it was, but there was something else. There was a connection with something in Japan when I was singing, it kind of took me away, you know. So, I mean, there's something about whatever, uh, my past is my karma, uh, you know, that people, you know, um, hang around, you know. Was that the um, Tokyo Prog Festival with Steve Hackett? No, uh, 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 no, that was when I went, to, I just flew on my own um, to, to donate that uh, guitar to raise funds for the uh, the kids that had lost all their musical instruments and everything it was it was connected to music cares as well so it was in Nagoya I went yeah but uh, no the yeah we did the open air thing with Steve that was god that it was about 98 degrees on that stage there was no air anywhere anywhere and all the all, all the fans had fans I thought, what one of those fans? And it's the only time ever in my career I've sung with sweat pouring down my face constantly. I can send you one of those fans. Oh, can you? <laughs> yeah, I literally, literally have probably 30 or 40 of them. Oh, really? <laughs> because we, I designed the stuff for that festival. Oh, 
Oh, did you? Oh, yes, you did. I remember that now. Yeah. Well, you won't meet the fan immediately. But <laughs> <laughs> I it was, but watching them, it was like, it was, it was torture. It was done on purpose, you know. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Annie, it, we, we've been talking for just over an hour. Oh, so, sorry. We haven't even got to half the things I want to I know, talk got to music. And music, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, we nearly did. I have to tell you one thing, though, that, that really um, helped me musically um, in the, in, during, you know, the pandemic and what's going on now is that um, I had a, a birthday video that was made made up for me by Jeffrey Langley, who's, who's one of the keyboard players now, and um, it was fabulous. He um, he got um, Jeff Downs to put a message on there. Steve Steve Hackett, uh, Michael from Opeth. Do you know uh, Mikhail? Do you know? Oh, yeah, uh, him um, and. Um, I, I, what I did afterwards is I contacted everybody to say thank you. Uh, and uh, when I was talk thanking Jeff, I said, how, how do you feel about writing a song for John? You know, John Wetton. Yes. And so, he said, oh, that's a great idea. And like, so uh, now we, he came up with a title pretty quickly called Stars in Heaven. And I, I wrote the words um, about my experiences, you know, um, going over to see John. And when was it? Uh, 2000? Oh, gosh. It seems so long ago now, uh, 2003, was it? But anyway, um, and uh, it, it, John was a very big fan of ABBA. So this song, oh, is, uh, and I love ABBA. I mean, I think they're great. <clears throat> and, um, uh, and and so it has this wonderful ABBA feel, but it's all me, you know. It's like, it, and of course, I love harmonizing with myself because I can sing high and I can sing low, you know. And it worked really well. So that is it, really kind of... Um, help me get you know just doing some music because I can't do anything with my band and to do a zoom thing with our band it's just I don't want to sing Mother Russia in my kitchen you know I can't <laughs> I, it's I don't want people to remember me for that you know so um anyway I, yeah it, it was fun so that really helped me get get through this and it's it's not come out yet but it's you know it's it's almost finished I did my vocals and um, with Rave up in Warwick, New York, and uh, didn't have to wear a mask in the studio, thank goodness, because you can't sing it with a mask on. But I, I, I'm not sure if this isn't just a false memory, but for some reason I think you you could sing arias, you could sing soprano. Well, I was, uh, I'm a coloratura soprano, and, and I started singing, uh, I went for singing lessons, I went to Shirley Bassey's teacher first, um, and uh, he couldn't take me on uh, in the daytime. He couldn't take me on in the evening because he had, uh, I had a daytime job and he couldn't, he could, he, you know, he worked only in the daytime. So he put me onto an opera singer called Sybil Knight. And I was with her for about nine months. And, um, and she, that's where I found I got five octaves, you know, because I was breathing from my diaphragm and not from my throat. And uh, yeah, she 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 wanted me to to go into opera. She said your voice is, and it, she said it's an unusual. You have an unusual tone in your voice, and you know it, you'd be per, it would be great for you. But I didn't want to be stuck in one place all the time, hmm. and I just didn't know where I was going to go at that point either. I just had no idea, no plans, nothing. You know, but but it's a it's a long story. Can yeah. I come back? <laughs> yeah. Shall we do another one and talk about the music and the singing? Yeah, let's do that because it, it's a shame to rush it, really. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I I did actually plan not to talk about music. I thought we would talk about other things, the the art, where ideas come from. Yeah. Yeah, things, yeah. Which we did a little bit. Yeah. And I thought we would save the music. So if you're up for it, we'll do it again. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, when we finished, I'm going to send you a copy of this, but you might not get it till tomorrow morning because. Okay, no problem. I'm going to go and see Steve Howe now. So. You go what? I'm, I'm going over to the studio to see Steve. Oh, where is he? 
he's recording at um, uh, Kurtis Schwartz Studio, which is about oh, eight okay. miles away. Yeah. But give him my love, will you please? I will, absolutely yeah. I will. Yeah. Andy, thank you so much for joining me. I, I have to stop because you can hear my voices saying goodbye. <laughs> oh, really? You see, I could go on Not enough today. <laughs> because, because I learned to breathe properly, I can talk forever. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a bit late for me to learn to breathe. No. Actually, you know, there's a guy, there's a guy called Wim, W-I-M, Huff, H-U-F-F. And he holds a Guinness records for breathing under uh, uh, under the ice or some, something ridiculous. But this guy is very healthy and he has the most amazing um, breathing exercises. Very, 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 very simple. You can, you, and you can work, you can just look him up and, and I'll see if I can find the one that I did. It's really easy, but like after, after doing it for like five minutes, not even five minutes actually, you, you, you're breathing differently because that's why we get sick a lot of it you know we're not we're not breathing you know all of a sudden no. i think i'm not breathing oh hang on <laughs> you know well, if you find it please send me a link i will I'll, 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 I'll look for it in a minute and send it to you it's brilliant because if you're talking a lot like this you need to keep your voice tuned in tuned up you know i do <laughs> annie it's brilliant thank you so much uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry I was a bit rude, and if anybody's if anybody's watching me, um, you know that I, I I don't mean to say rude things, but I like to make people laugh, you know, and I think I like to shock people sometimes as well. I think you'll have done both. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was brilliant, and I think you're wonderful and very brave. And oh, well. thank you. <laughs> All right, give my love to Freya. I and, will. Uh, and Steve, I will. Yeah, and, and, and let me know when you want to do it again. That's not a problem. I might try and find a better place in the house. Oh, I love this place, right opposite the paintings. Yeah. And where it's you're you sitting now is better than where you were at the beginning. Yeah, it, yeah, it is much better. Well, it, it's, the light's changing outside in the curtain and all that stuff, you know, like it does. Thank you. <laughs> all right. All right. Thank you, Roger. See you soon. Yeah, talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.